Hello there! Welcome to Skelling Key Productions. I'm Kwame Burroughs Kokon. Let's get into the video. And today's video, we're going to be continuing uh, the political theory series and where we've been looking at a whole different range of political ideologies. So if you haven't seen those videos, please look onto the rest of the channel. Um, it should be in the playlist uh, called uh, Political uh, Theories. And um, yeah, let's get into the video. But before we do that, you know what I'm going to say? I say it every single day. Thank you to the ones of you who have actually subscribed, who have been commenting, who have been liking. Really appreciate that, yeah. You're actually, you know, trying to build this thing and like, you know, create some sort of community spirit as such. And uh, so I really like the people who have taken part and wanted to be an active member of that community. It's really helped out the channel and um, it's really been appreciated. The rest of y'all, the rest of y'all are just like, freeloaders you're you're just watching youtube videos you're not like actually helping the channel out at all you're just you're just getting all that information you're not actually doing anything yeah so you know what i mean I, it, ta it takes a lot of effort to to make these videos and you're just there just being like yeah i'm just gonna look on my phone oh yeah watch a video oh yeah oh yeah, that's interesting oh yeah that's interesting i've learned lots of things from this i've learned a lot of things right anyway on to on to some cat videos yeah i find that disrespectful isn't it so you know what I'm saying? No more freeloaders, yeah? You're watching this video, time to subscribe. You know what time it is, or else. Actually, what's quite fitting about this video is that I spent so much time making, making idle threats to people who I'll never be able to find out whether they've subscribed or not. And um, yeah, I actually forgot to introduce what this video is about, although you could probably work it out from the title. It's, we're talking about the political ideology of fascism. So we're gonna look at the history, we're gonna look at the, the um, that's it. It's quite difficult saying the great thinkers of, of fascism because it kind of gives it a, a level of notoriety that, yeah, the, the, the main thinkers of fascism um, and some of the, you know, some of the main actors within, within that kind of movement. And, um, and yeah, so a lot of the time people, obviously, everyone knows about like World War Two. they know about the rise of Hitler, etc, etc. We're going to try and delve into a bit more of the, the deeper history of that and, um, and some of the other kind of movements that you haven't seen so much. We will talk more about, you know, we will talk more about some of the effects of fascism, um, especially in, in our later video of, um, of uh, uh, regarding anti-Semitism. Although even for that, yeah, like we're going to, again focus more on the stuff that people don't know because i feel like this channel is more beneficial to new things that you don't know rather than things that you probably do know but there's other channels that could tell it in a lot more detail and do do the, the topic a lot more justice than we're able to do here so um there will be links in the description uh for uh between the between two wars um and and um and uh world world war two uh these are really really good channels um so yeah so definitely check those out if you want a lot more of a deeper deeper analysis on it but for now we're going to get into the rest of the video now for anyone who watches uh like you know anyone who like goes on social media or watches the news and stuff people are always talking about that person a fascist that person a fascist da -da. But I think like the word has been overused to the extent that people don't actually know the exact meaning, right? Um, George, even George Orwell back in, in the 1940s yeah, said that the term fascist has become the most overused word in the English language. Um, and that was, you know, over 70 years ago, right? So n never mind nowadays, right? But he said that the way that people use the word fascist in, in, in the English speaking world now, it's almost akin to kind of saying a bully, right? which you probably could make a strong argument for that, but that's not exactly very specific, right? So to talk about fascism, we're gonna talk about the, the root of the word, right? So it comes from, 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 from the Italian uh, for, for fascist, which is um, a bundle of sticks, right? So the idea of fascism is this, right? If you have one stick, yeah, it's like, it's relatively easy to, to break. If you have a bundle of sticks, yeah, then it becomes, like almost impossible to break right so the idea of fascism was that the individual is weak but together coming together as a nation yeah then they are strong and they cannot be broken right so that is the kind of idea of of fascism right so fascism is defined as being anti-liberal anti-conservative and anti-communist right um and it's it's mainly typified with um with mass mo uh, with like you know 
uh, mass mass uh, displays of, of kind of, of loyalty to the, to the party uh, is, is defined as uh, militaristic um, it's defined as uh, having a very strong leader um, who's, who's kind of set to like rule like an empire uh, goes out and conquers like lesser lesser like peoples and um, and yeah like the whole the whole thing is a very incredibly nationalistic like ultra nationalistic um, uh, kind of uh, view of itself right so this is what we actually mean by fascism right and it's also it's some people will say it's on the left of politics some people say it's on the right of politics actually there's many elements of it where oh god say someone's using the hot water in the house we're just gonna have to deal with the, the boiler making noise um that's distracting god say why does it make so much noise anyway so if I talk very, very loudly, you might be able to hear me. So some, some bits of it are defined as being left-wing and some are defined as being right-wing, right? So on economics, right, it's actually typically seen as being somewhat left-wing because rather than being like in favour of free markets and, 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 um, and free trade and stuff here, yeah, um, fascism oftentimes is, 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 like, is in favour of um, autarky, which is having... Um, everything being created within one's own nation, right? Um, I believe it was, I believe it was, um, uh, I believe it was one of the, one of the famous Nazis, yeah, said that the only thing that the Third Reich should be important would, should be oranges or, or some, or some, 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 like, some variation on that. So basically, everything that can be produced within the nation ought to be produced within the nation, right? And, um, and yeah, oh no, it's coffee. That's what, that's what he said, that's the only thing that should be in, um, imported. So, so on, in terms of trade, that's what, what it looks like. In terms of national economies, how a fascist state typically runs is, as we've discussed in, in our previous videos talking about, um, talk about economics, um, it's very much along corporatist lines, right? So, the, so businesses are allowed to run, but with, within those businesses, it's a situation where, um, yeah, within those businesses, it's a situation where the state is in, it allows private businesses to operate, but realistically, they are the final ones in charge. There is not really a notion of like the protection of private property because at the end of the day, everything is you know, as Mussolini said, nothing, everything within the state, nothing outside of the state, right? So everything is controlled by the state, right? So, so if if um, if the government decides that your car making uh, factory needs to be turned into a tank making factory then you don't really have much say on that. The government has, has, has told you what to do, right? And, but so on social issues, we tend to think of it as being right-wing though. So it, so it, and it does fit many of the definitions for a uh, conservative, yeah, um, or for being right-wing in the sense of it being reactionary. But the thing is, fascism oftentimes is actually far more than just uh, kind of conservative like kind of uh, thing in terms of like keeping the status quo if anything oftentimes it's a very revolutionary thing which doesn't even seek it certain elements of it it seeks to completely overturn the, the the kind of new way of doing things and go back to this old way but also adds in extra things um from before so it's not just harking back to the past it wants to reshape the future in a very fundamental like way right so this is this these are some of the hallmarks of what we mean by the actual fascism so don't think of it as a left wing or right wing ideology think of it as it has a mixture of of both right which explains some of its broader appeal and why it crosses like why it has like traditionally crossed over many different um class um uh, class lines um as opposed to what we might think of as other um other political ideologies which tend to be more class-based right now I just found out that um, someone in my household is running the bath um, so yes this is going to be quite annoying um, but because I'm in full flow anyway we're just gonna power through it um, and yeah so anyway so in terms of talking about um, fascism as as an ideology and when it first kind of originated yeah um, historically speaking one could look at the um, ancient city of state of Sparta as an early example like everyone who's seen the, the film 300 yeah will know that um, children in um, from the moment people were born in Sparta uh, people would look at 
the, the, the babies, right? And see whether there was any de uh, birth defects at all. And then they would throw them off of a cliff. Also, when the, when the young boys uh, were, were, were being raised, um, they'd be taken away from their mothers and, and sent out to, 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 to the woods and stuff to have to fight for, for survival. And only the ones who were the toughest and, and the most able to survive would then go on to be men. And then everything in their society was drill, drill, drill towards being a soldier. And that was it, right? And that, uh, yeah, and women had a very subservient place in Sparta, like even more so, uh, even more subservient than, than it would have been in other uh, city-states. And, um, and yeah, so everything is, and, you know, and there's not, within, within, um, within Sparta as well, everything was, see, this, the noise is gone now. Within Sparta as well, the king basically ran as a tyrant, so you didn't have the more democratic system which you had um, in which you had in Athens. Um, like he did have some advisors and stuff, but mainly the king was the one who's in charge, right? So that was obviously over two thousand years ago, but they wouldn't have really considered what we think of today as fascism, right? The modern idea of fascism arose from. France, right, and um, it's quite like um, the 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 British historian David Starkey uh, often quips that um, all bad ideas come from France, and um, hmm, he might have some level of a point, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's um, that's 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 open to interpretation. But I think if looking at this political theory series, I think quite a lot of the bad ideas probably have, so he might have a point there. So in the turn of the last century, um, I, you know, the, the late 1800s, right, um, France was going through a lot of uh, political and social upheaval. Um, it just lost the war um, uh, to, 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 um, to Prussia, which, which soon became uh, the German Empire. Um, so so it, it obviously been humiliated in that war with German uh, soldiers uh, entering Paris. Um, it was being overtaken by other um, European nations um, as, as the like, dominant power on the continent. And its sense of itself was really kind of shaken to its core with many people wanting to go back to the, the time of like kind of, of the monarchy and some people wanting to defend the Republic. And obviously some people who were revolutionaries and communists, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, who wanted to overturn the entire Africa, right? So in this kind of me messed up mix basically of, of, of all these different competing factions right we had two people yeah in particular we had George uh, 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 George my oh, French is terrible George Va Valou Va George Valou Va Valou whatever George Valou and um, and Charles um, and Charles um, um, and Charles, um, um, uh, Charles Morass you know I should have practiced the pronunciation of this before filming but anyway these two intellectuals right uh, they kind of came together and started coming up with ideas for what we would describe today as, as fascism and kind of you know recognizing that it's a mixture of left-wing and right-wing ideas right and moving forwards these ideas started to spread to other places in in Europe in particular in Italy and Germany right which is obviously where the, the, many of the fascist ideas arose from, as well as also to Spain and Portugal. So many of these ideas really started to come to fruition um, around the time of the beginning of World War I. And um, Yo, uh, Yo, bleh, Johann, um, Johann, how does one pronounce his name? Johann Plenge, that was it, yeah. Johann Ple, 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 Plenge? Apologies if I'm, I'm butchering the German there, right? Johann Plenge um, argued that World War I, from, from the German perspective, yeah, had to be a war against liberalism. It had to be a war against, as he called it, the ideas of 1789. So the French Revolution, the Enlightenment era, all of the, these ideas had to be completely done away with. And, you know, he was in favour very much of, of the, the Kaiser in Germany having absolute kind of like authority and crushing the liberalism and all the other um, ideologies like kind of take part in Europe at that point, right? So he and other people like him saw the German war effort in World War I as the, the, the hopeful destruction of the liberal war, world order at that time, right? And 
you know, this, this is something which is not really focused on enough. Many times people talk about fascism as just a right-wing ideology and they have it as a kind of juxtaposed and like kind of opposing uh, a force uh, to counter um, communism, right? But these two ideas actually, in practice, had quite a lot of overlap uh, to them. And many of the, the founding uh, fathers of fascism actually came from 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 from, from socialist um, uh, movements and stuff, right? So World War One was also a bit of a schism within the the kind of worldwide socialist movement, you know, as we as we've mentioned in previous videos, because there were some people who believed that you know the work the, the works of the world have no nation state, um, you know workers of the world unite, like kind of internationalism, right? But there was also another section that believed very firmly in nationalism, right? Who believed very firmly in, you know, their nation winning that war, right? And many of the people who went off to go and fight in that war became people like um, Benito Mussolini, became people like Adolf Hitler, became people like many of the other uh, very prominent people uh, within the, 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 the fledgling um, post-war um, uh, fascist movements, right? So... They argued within this that you know this war was was a good like kind of like like kind of chance to actually expunge these nations of any of the kind of like weakening um uh, like you know, any of the kind of like weakening that had had been there throughout like by having liberalism um they believed that their societies had become weak had become decadent and so this war was a, a way of reasserting uh, the kind of like the pride and the uh, and the spirit of of their nations right and especially in germany um the the work the work of uh, friedrich nietzsche end up being corrupted uh, so so this idea of the ubermensch yeah um you know the the supermen ended up being really propagated by certain by certain elements who believed that through through this war this would be a way of creating you know the stepping stones towards that ubermensch so Johann Plenge, yeah, as we've mentioned, had you know he he was the first person who like, coined the term of national socialism, but the first time where explicitly you have something called the fascist, you know, something called fascist, yeah, was in the fascist uh, manifesto uh, by um, by um, Mar Marionetti. See, my Italian accent is a little little bit better, hopefully. Uh, so Marionetti, uh, he created the fascist manifesto and he did this in 1919. This was after the, the end of the war and after the, the kind of rise of Bolshevik movements, both in, in communist Russia and across m many other places in Europe, right? So he argued, right, for many, many left-wing things, such as, you know, an eight-hour like, kind of eight day. Uh, he argued for uh, retirement at 55, um, which doesn't sound like such a bad idea, actually. Retirement at 55. That's what I'm aiming for anyway. Um, but, you know, many other people, you know, um, uh, such as, you know, eventually Benito Mussolini and um, someone called um, uh, Di, Di, Di Anzio, uh, these people started to come together and actually start to really mould this idea of fascism and really, like, have it as something, like, have it as, like, a political platform to actually stand on rather than this kind of these vague ideas, yeah? So now you start to see fascism turn from just an uh, amalgamation of different ideas to now an actual political, like, movement, yeah, that they're actually trying to implement. So this all culminated in 1922 with the famous March on Rome, led by Mussolini. So Mussolini wanted to, you know, he, he marched all the way to Rome to speak to, to the king and order and, like, demand that there be, you know, uh, uh, setting up of you know setting up of, of a fascist government. So in the early years, as with many of these movements, yeah, they don't start off immediately on, on day one by being like, right, we're going to abolish this and do this, that, right. It was very slow at first, yeah, like it was very like calm. It was very you know, and then over time, yeah, within the space of about two to three years, all of a sudden they started becoming a lot more repressive. And, you know, with it, you know, very, in a very, very short amount of time, all the freedoms that post-war Italy had had end up being completely subverted by Mussolini. And Mussolini ended up becoming El Duce, which is 
the leader, right? And, you know, ju like some people, you know, it's during this time, some people um, had a lot of support for it. A lot of people kind of felt that, well, actually, in terms of all the, the turmoil that's going on at the moment, yeah, maybe, maybe democracy is not the best way. Maybe, like as Mussolini said, maybe men are, have become tired of, of, of liberty, right? Maybe they want someone who's in charge who can just, you know, keep the trains running on time, as, as, as the old saying went, yeah. And, um, and you know, re restore a sense of national pride and a sense of uh, national order like, to, to the place. And also these ideas obviously rose in, in post-war Germany as well. Uh, you saw like the Beer Hall uh, Putsch of 1924, uh, which was uh, an attempt, obviously, to replicate the march on Rome, uh, where Hitler wanted to you know, overthrow the, the, the Weimar Republic and set up a fascist state there. Although obviously he was unsuccessful at that time. Now famously, Christopher Hitchens, uh, uh, well, yeah, the late Christopher Hitchens, uh, made the point that fascist, uh, fascist parties across Europe during this time uh, were very, very linked to the Catholic Church. Now, there's elements to this which are true, in the sense that many um, prominent um, fascists, both in, in Italy and in Germany and across many other places in Europe, did have a strong belief in, in, in like the Catholic Church and stuff, whether it be Spain or uh, Slovakia or many other places ar ar around, around there too. Um, but realistically, it was a thing of fascism at its core had a great disdain for the for the kind of niceties that you kind of have within, you know, if you believe that kind of like Jesus, you know, is this peaceful man, you know, he's kind of almost, some might say, describe him as a cool, almost like a cool, like, like hippie dude, like kind of like, like, it's quite hard to have that mixed with this kind of idea of like the, the you know, the having a strong militaristic state, like the two, the two kind of like ideas, like really clash with each other, right? And so, what we see in many uh, um, in fascist countries here yeah, is either this, right? Either one or two things. Either one, they try to find some sort of common ground with the Catholic Church. They try to do little like deals and stuff like Concordia, where you kind of go, all right, cool. Like we won't we won't mess with the church if you guys like stay out of politics, right? And they try and do some sort of things like this here, right? However. During the 20s and 30s um, and, and into the 40s, of course, yeah, um, you still did have many uh, prominent Catholic priests and, you know, Protestant priests, etc, etc. And many, many people like who were religiously minded, who spoke up and were like, were actually either arrested or murdered uh, by the, the different fascist uh, organisations, right? So it's not, it's not as easy as just saying, oh, well, they're all Catholic. And also as well, Benito Mussolini himself was like was throughout his much of his life like an atheist, right? And even Hitler, um, he he never renounced his Catholic faith, but like we like you know in Mein Kampf he he, he quite clearly kind of like kind of says that um, he would have preferred it if if um, if Europe had had gone under Islam uh, rather than Christianity because he believed Islam to be a more warlike uh, religion. Whether that's right or, or wrong. That was his, his views on it. He believed that Christianity was too soft. So again, kind of linking Christianity to fascism um, is something that's been done from time to time, but it's not particularly accurate. Oh my God, why is the, uh, the boiler is always making noise? Uh. Now, as we said, yeah, we're not gonna be able to go through all the, the in-depth of what happened in like World War II with the rise of the Nazis stuff, because like I said, that's been covered extensively. Um, but it is very, it's, it's very important to recognise that for people who, um, for people who want to understand what happened in World War Two uh, in Europe, they have to read Mein Kampf, right? That's how, like, don't that other one has been misinterpreted in terms of in, an endorsement of Mein Kampf uh, or hit the second book, um, as the Zwei book, um, but both of those books clearly outline everything which. Hitler is planning to do in World War Two, many years that like, you know. So, Mein Kampf is written in 1924, right? We can clearly see what what is what is going to happen, like 20 years like hence, right? Just from reading that book, 
So pe those the people who kind of the people who kind of think that oh Hitler he just you know everyone in the 1920s or 30s who had a copy of that book could clearly see what path Hitler was going to go down and what his exact war aims were going to be. And so if one is a historian, if one wishes to understand and get inside the mindset of Hitler and what he was doing in World War II, one has to read Mein Kampf. And again, this is a very, very important thing. Within Mein Kampf, Hitler talks about communism, but he talks about it when he critiques it, he critiques it more as he just kind of has it almost like a throwaway line in terms of, well, um, internationalism, it, it doesn't make any sense because, like, you know, like, like workers in different places around the world all earning different wages and etc. And da, 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 da. then also, obviously, there's the, the strong racial element to which he like, uh, like opposes it by saying that all the different races of the world should not unite together just because they're workers, right? Um, and he obviously criticizes uh, communism with being uh, this Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy, right? It's where like the Jews are somehow like in charge of like this global conspiracy to spread uh, communism, right? But the within Mein Kampf, there is a whole chapter devoted to critiquing liberal, uh, like the, the li liberal democracy and capitalism in general, right? There's a whole chapter devoted to actually you know, crit critiquing everything about it, critiquing the fact that um, having having many people making decisions means that the decisions become uh, a weaker, uh, that like, you know, that that it, like having a free society is more decadent, that everything, basically having, he, he argues against liberalism far more than he argues against communism. Communism is merely just competing uh, ideology for the exact same type of voters, yeah, There's either, you know, the only real difference between those who'd vote communist and those who'd vote, um, vote, who'd vote Nazi yeah, would be, you know, the certain elements of, like, of the, the bourgeois, like, middle class and stuff, right, but that was kind of it. The one group of people that neither group could really appeal to were the free-minded liberal thinkers, right, because the, these people were not interested in authoritarian top-down regimes, yeah, that, that suppressed people's freedom and had enemy classes or enemy races, right? So liberalism, that is the real counter to both communism and fascism. But then the communists would then fight back and basically say, no, actually, as Lenin said, fascism is merely capitalism in crisis. Now, to what extent is, is, this, is this true? Well, it does have a kernel of truth in that whenever there has been um, a, a collapse, a crisis in, in capitalism, right, there has been the rise of extremist groups. But what communists tend to fail to mention is that actually it's not so much capitalism in crisis of itself, it's capitalism in crisis of being taken over by communists, right? So in every single situation where we see fascism rise to prominence, yeah? Whether it's in Spain or, or Germany or Italy or any other place, right? Uh, Chile, uh, all around the world, right? Every single time that it rises, it rises in developed nations, right? And it, it rises in developed nations because of this. In a largely peasant-based society like this, like old, like, like the old Russian Empire, or like China, right before before its revolution, or Cuba, or many other places you can think of, right, where you have like a, a peasant population who are very uneducated, um, who are very poor, etc., etc. There is no, there is no like real middle class other than a handful of people somewhere in some like some of the cities, right. So. There's not much of a kind of bourgeois class to actually really be opposed to, right? Um, and, you know, so as a result... Oh no, it's bloody boiling again. Uh, you know, for in the future, I need to film when, when no one else is in. Anyway, in societies where you have an industrialised workforce here, yeah, where you have a bourgeois uh, middle class uh, that, that's quite extensive and quite powerful and stuff, right? Um, then these people, when it comes 
time to it. They go, hmm, we're in time of crisis. Do you want to pick the communists who are going to line us all up against the wall and shoot us and steal our wealth? Or do we want fascists who might go after some, some groups that we don't particularly like and stuff, yeah, but they're going to basically leave us alone? Hmm. So in terms of picking the lesser of two poisons, right, people in that class will pick you know that one right and also in terms of like working people again working people if they have any sense of like national pride are not really going to go for this whole internationalist kind of like hairy furry like imagine there's no no countries kind of vibe right they're going to go for the the, the patriotic like the kind of like the nationalistic like like party uh, like alternative in that right so anyone who kind of thinks that you could have a rise of communism, yeah, in, in a developed country without there being a subsequent and greater reaction to it as a rise of fascism, you know, history has borne that out. The only time when a, a communist, um, a communist um, has ever been elected to government was in Chile, yeah, with, with, with Salvador Allende, right? And he won very, very narrowly because the opposition was split. He won very, very narrowly and when he started to implement his reforms, the bourgeois people within Chile, right, rose up against him and basically was like, no, 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 we're not having this, we're not having you to completely destroy the economy with this hyperinflation, et cetera, et cetera. And so you ended up with Pinochet doing a, a military coup and taking over the country and running it like from 1973 to 1990, right? And actually during the Cold War period, we see even though Nazi Germany and fascist Italy yeah, have been defeated, right, you start to see, you know, well, you see regimes like Franco Spain and, um, and uh, Salvador, um, Sa Sa Salvador, I can't remember the dude's last name yet, or first name, whatever, like um, Salvador in, 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 in Portugal, right? And these regimes continue on to the, the mid 70s, yeah, when these dictators eventually died. But across many places in Latin America, you see military coup after military coup with fascist um, uh, military juntas uh, 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 taking over. And this is part of, within the context of the Cold War, again, America has to choose yeah, between, right, do we want communists taking over Latin America or can we deal with fascists taking over Latin America, right? And so if... Again, if it's a toss up between the two and you're fighting a world war, uh, like a world like a worldwide like conflict against communism, you're going to pick the lesser of two evils. Right. As, as far as they're concerned. So this is why throughout like, the, the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, you see the rise of these fascist movements across um, uh, across Latin America. And then as soon as the Cold War is over, you start to see the collapse of these places and a return back to uh, uh, like liberal democracies. So, we've basically covered the history of fascism here, but to what extent does fascism pose a threat to us, um, or depending on your outlook, um, does it have much of a future, right? And as I've said, I believe that fascism within developed countries will only arise and can only arise if there is a rise of communism preceding it, right? If there's a rise of communism and people feel that their property is going to be taken from them and their lives are going to be like, like taken from them, then they will, whether they, they support it or not, they will go towards the lesser of two evils. And so fascism, fascism does not take much of like, it does not have much support amongst people in and of itself, right? Uh, a happy, prosperous people um, with opportunities that have not been humiliated, humiliated yet yeah, does not have much like in, in store for, it doesn't have much, much love towards a regime that openly endorses taking away their freedoms and, and giving it in the hands of a dictator. People only tend to do that if they fear the alternative being worse. So that said, Thank you for, for watching and uh, stay tuned uh, for the next video, which is going to be on, um, it's going to be on libertarianism, right? Uh, so, you know, definitely stay tuned for that. And, um, and again, if you haven't liked or subscribed or, or written a comment, please do. And I'll see you next time. Bye.